It was a cloudless day in late spring when I married Sarah. The sun was a grand witness, pouring its golden light over the vineyard where we exchanged our vows. Sarah looked radiant in a flowing dress that caught the light with every step she took towards me. Our families gathered, a mixture of emotions painted on their faces, joy, nostalgia, and the bittersweet tang of memories of days gone by. As we stood there, hands clasped, I recalled the whirlwind romance that had swept us here. We had met during our final year of college, a chance encounter at a mutual friend's art exhibit. Her laughter was the first thing I noticed bright and clear, a sound that seemed to make the world pause. From that moment, I was irretrievably drawn to her, a moth to her incandescent glow. My love, Sarah whispered as she slipped the ring out of my finger, her voice steady despite the tears brimming in her azure eyes. With this ring, I give you my heart. And I mine, I replied, the weight of my promise anchoring the moment. The crowd erupted into cheers as we sealed our vows with a kiss, a promise of forever. Little did I know, the forever we imagined was but a fragile dream, ready to be shattered by the secrets waiting just on the horizon. At the reception, I noticed her mother, Helen, watching us with an intensity that bordered on unsettling. Helen had always been a figure of elegance and resilience, having raised Sarah alone under trying circumstances. Today she was dressed impeccably in a soft blue gown that complemented her still youthful features. Her smile was warm, but her eyes, those sharp green mirrors, held stories she'd never spoken aloud. I approached her, raising my glass. Thank you, Helen, for everything. She hugged me, her embrace a little too tight, a little too long. Take care of her, she whispered, her voice a mingled note of warning and warmth. As the day gave way to a starlit evening, I found myself gazing at Sarah, dancing and laughing, her joy infectious. But across the room, Helen's eyes met mine, a silent conversation and a glance. Unbeknownst to me, our lives were about to unravel, woven as they were with threads of desire and deceit that would challenge the very vows I had just made. It was only four years into our marriage when Sarah's stepfather, Sam, passed away. A man of quiet habits and simpler tastes, Sam had lived a life marked by discipline and modesty, yet his sudden heart attack left everyone around him grappling with a shock. Sarah was devastated, of course, but it was Helen who seemed to unravel at the seams. I found myself thrust into a role I had never anticipated. With Sarah too grief-stricken to handle the logistical nightmares of death, I stepped up to manage the affairs. I dealt with lawyers, funeral arrangements, and endless forms. During this period, Helen and I were thrown together more often than ever before. She relied on my support, leaning on my shoulder during the funeral, her sobs cutting through the somber drone of the eulogy. One evening, after a long day of sorting through Sam's belongings, Helen invited me to stay for dinner. The house felt unusually large and empty. Echoes of Sam's presence lingered in the silent hallways and the meticulously organized living room. You've been such a support, Alex, Helen said as she poured us each a glass of wine. Her hands were steady, but I noticed a tremor in her voice. I don't know how we would have coped without you. It's the least I could do, I replied, trying to offer a comforting smile. The wine glowed ruby red in the dim light, and our conversation meandered from memories of Sam to the raw edges of our current lives. As the night grew deeper, so did our discussions. Helen shared stories of her youth, of dreams deferred and opportunities lost. She spoke of her brief, youthful romance before she became pregnant with Sarah, a chapter of her life she had buried deep. I married Sam because I needed stability, not because I loved him. She confessed, her gaze lost in the flickering candlelight. He was a good man, but there was never any passion. Her vulnerability struck a chord in me. I reached across the table, covering her hand with mine in a gesture of comfort. The contact was meant to be platonic, but the electricity in that single touch spoke of something more, something dangerous and undeniable. We quickly pulled away, a mutual but unspoken acknowledgement of the boundary we nearly crossed. Yet in that moment, something shifted between us. A door had been opened, and the path beyond it promised to be as tumultuous as it was tempting. Months had passed since Sam's death, and life seemed to settle into a new normal. Sarah and I continued our daily routines, but an undercurrent of tension had woven itself into the fabric of our marriage. 
She threw herself into her work with a fervor that left little room for us, often coming home late, her eyes avoiding mine, her conversations clipped and distracted. One cold evening in November, a month riddled with rain and whispered secrets, my world tilted on its axis. I was tidying up some files on our shared computer when I stumbled upon a series of emails between Sarah and a co-worker named Tom. The messages were flirtatious at first, harmless on the surface, but as I scrolled through, the words became intimate, their plans explicit. My heart hammered against my ribs, a cruel echo of betrayal. I sat back, feeling as though the air had been sucked from the room. I wanted to confront her immediately, to demand explanations, but I needed time to process the sheer magnitude of her deceit. That night at dinner, I watched her laugh and chatter about trivial things. Her ease and normalcy twisted the knife deeper. Finally, I could hold it no longer. Sarah, I set my voice steadier than I felt. Are you happy with us? She paused, forked midway to her lips, her eyes narrowing slightly. Of course, Alex. Why do you ask? It just seems like we're drifting apart. I ventured, watching her closely. She sighed, a well-rehearsed expression of frustration playing across her features. It's just work stress, nothing more. We're fine, Alex. But we weren't fine. After dinner, I confronted her with the emails. Her face paled, her usual composure crumbling under the weight of her secrets. Alex, it, it meant nothing. It was just a stupid mistake, she stammered, her voice laced with desperation. A mistake that lasted months. My voice was bitter, the words tasting of betrayal. She reached out to me, tears brimming in her eyes, but I stepped back, unable to bear the touch of someone who had so thoroughly deceived me. I need some space, I said coldly, turning away from the brokenness in her eyes. That night, I packed a bag and moved to a nearby hotel. The next morning, I started the painful process of untangling our intertwined lives, driven by the sharp sting of infidelity. In the bleak anonymity of my hotel room, days blended into one another, each as gray and indistinct as the weather outside. The initial shock of Sarah's betrayal gave way to a numbing sort of pain, a persistent ache that settled deep in my bones. I was in the middle of this fog when I heard a knock at the door. I opened it to find Helen standing there, her eyes somber, her posture tense. It was unexpected. While we had grown closer since Sam's death, this felt different. She wore a simple coat over a dark dress, and her hands were clasped tightly in front of her. Alex, may I come in? she asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Of course, I said, stepping aside to let her enter. She moved with a hesitance that was unlike her, taking in the starkness of the hotel room with a sad tilt of her head. I heard about what happened, she began, sitting down on the edge of the solitary chair. I'm so sorry, Alex. Thank you, Helen, I replied, feeling the weight of her sympathy. It's been tough. She looked at me, her green eyes sharp with a mixture of concern and something else, something deeper. I know it's not my place, but Sarah told me what she did. She's devastated, Alex. I sighed, sitting across from her on the bed. I don't know what to do, Helen. I feel so betrayed. Helen reached out, her hand brushing mine. Betrayal is a difficult wound to heal, she said softly. But don't let it close your heart. We talked for a long time about everything and nothing. Her past, my pain, our uncertain futures. Helen's presence was strangely comforting, her voice a soothing balm to my frayed nerves. As the conversation drifted, I noticed how the light softened her features, how her concern seemed tinged with a gentle affection. When it was time for her to leave, she stood and hesitated. Then, in a move that surprised us both, she leaned forward and hugged me. It was a warm, lingering embrace filled with empathy and an unspoken promise of support. As she stepped back, her cheeks were slightly flushed. Take care of yourself, Alex, and remember I'm here if you need anything. Watching her leave, I felt a mix of emotions swirling inside me, gratitude, confusion, and a budding sense of connection that I couldn't quite dismiss. Helen had crossed the threshold that evening, not just into my hotel room, but into a place in my life where few had ventured before. The weeks that followed were a blur of lawyers, paperwork, and painful negotiations. 
The process of divorce, once just a distant concept, became my reality. Each meeting with my attorney felt like another step away from the life I thought I had built with Sarah. One chilly morning, I sat across from Sarah in the stark mediation room, the air thick with tension. She looked tired, worn out by guilt and the impending finality of our separation. Her eyes occasionally flickered to mine, searching for a sign of the warmth we once shared. Alex, she began hesitantly during a break, her voice low, I'm truly sorry. I never wanted to hurt you. I looked at her, really looked, and saw not just the woman who betrayed me, but also the person I had loved deeply. I know, I said, the words heavy with unspent emotion, but sorry doesn't undo what's been done. We settled our matters with clinical efficiency, our communication reduced to terse nods and the shuffling of documents. The finality of signing the papers was a relief in some ways, but it was also a stark reminder of how far we had drifted apart. After the meeting, I walked out into the cold, the signed divorce papers feeling like a weight in my briefcase. I was free, technically, but freedom had never felt so heavy. A few days later, Helen called. I heard the divorce is finalized, she said, her voice warm with sympathy. How are you holding up? It's done, I replied, my voice flat. I'm not sure what I'm feeling yet. It's a lot to process. Would you like some company? Helen asked gently. I could come over, maybe bring some dinner. I hesitated, keenly aware of the growing connection between us. That sounds nice, I finally said, surprised at my own eagerness. That evening, Helen arrived with a homemade lasagna and a bottle of red wine. Her presence filled my small kitchen, her easy chatter a contrast to the silence I had grown accustomed to. We ate, laughed, and for a few hours, the weight of the past months seemed to lift slightly. As she was about to leave, she paused at the door, turning to look at me. Alex, you're not alone, she said softly. No matter what happens, you have people who care about you. I care about you. Her words, sincere and kind, reached something deep inside me. I walked her to her car, the night air crisp and clear. Thank you, Helen, I said, feeling a profound gratitude for this woman who had unexpectedly become my anchor in a sea of chaos. As she drove away, I stood watching the taillights fade into the night, pondering the new and uncertain path that lay ahead. In the weeks that followed my divorce, Helen became a constant presence in my life. Her visits, initially meant to offer comfort, gradually evolved into long evenings filled with conversation, shared meals, and an intimacy that neither of us had initially intended. The more time we spent together, the more I found myself drawn to her in ways I hadn't anticipated. One brisk evening, Helen invited me over for dinner at her place, a cozy house that she had made a home with subtle touches of elegance and warmth. The aroma of roasted chicken filled the air as I stepped inside, and the familiar sense of comfort enveloped me. Helen, this looks wonderful. I complimented as she led me into the dining room where candles flickered softly. Thank you, Alex. It's always nicer to share a meal, she replied, her smile reaching her eyes. As we ate, the conversation flowed easily between us. We discussed books, our shared love for jazz, and the small, everyday things that suddenly seemed so much more interesting when spoken in her voice. After dinner, we moved to the living room, settling into the plush sofa with glasses of wine. Helen turned slightly toward me, tucking her legs under her. Alex, can I ask you something? She said, her tone serious yet hesitant. Of course, I replied, sensing the shift in her mood. How do you feel about us? She asked softly, her eyes searching mine for clues. I paused, taken aback by the directness of her question. The truth was, I had been asking myself the same thing. I, I enjoy our time together, Helen. More than I thought I would, I confessed. And I feel there's something between us, more than just friendship. Helen nodded slowly, a gentle blush coloring her cheeks. I feel it too, she admitted, but I'm also scared. We've both been through so much. Reaching out, I took her hand, feeling the warmth of her skin against mine. Maybe we don't need to decide anything right now, I suggested. Let's just see where this goes. She squeezed my hand in agreement, and we spent the rest of the evening talking and laughing, the initial awkwardness giving way to a comfortable, thrilling connection. Later that night, as I prepared to leave, 
Helen walked me to the door. We stood there for a moment, hesitating in the quiet hallway. Then, impulsively, I leaned in and kissed her. It was a soft, tentative kiss, but it spoke volumes. Helen responded with a gentle pressure, her hands coming up to rest on my chest. When we finally broke apart, there was a sense of something new and undefinable beginning between us. Good night, Alex, she whispered, her voice a mix of excitement and nervousness. Good night, Helen, I replied, stepping out into the night, the taste of her kiss lingering on my lips, the possibility of a new beginning swirling around us like the crisp autumn air. As autumn faded into the brisk chill of early winter, the connection between Helen and me deepened. Our relationship, nourished by shared moments and whispered confidences, bloomed quietly. Helen's house became a refuge from the solitude of my own, her laughter a melody that filled the corners of my heart with warmth. One snowy evening, as we watched the delicate flakes drift lazily through the air from her living room window, Helen turned to me with a contemplative look. Alex, this, us, it feels like a new beginning, doesn't it? She asked, her voice tinged with a mix of hope and uncertainty. It does, I agreed, my hand finding hers, our fingers intertwining naturally. I didn't expect to find something like this again, especially not with you. But I'm glad I did. We decided to venture out into the snow, bundling up in coats and scarves. The world outside was hushed, the usual sounds muffled under the thick blanket of white. We walked hand in hand, leaving twin sets of footprints behind us, charting a path through the untouched snow. As we walked, Helen shared more about her past, her dreams of painting, how life had taken her on a different course, and her aspirations that had been tucked away. I used to imagine a different life, one filled with art and adventure. She confessed, a note of wistfulness in her voice. And now, I asked, looking over at her, admiring the way her cheeks were flushed with the cold. Now, I think maybe it's not too late to find some of that adventure, she said, squeezing my hand. With you. The earnestness in her voice stirred something profound within me. We stopped walking, standing under the outstretched branches of an old oak, its limbs heavy with snow. Impulsively, I pulled her close, and we shared a kiss that felt like a promise under the watchful eyes of the winter stars. When we returned to her house, flushed with the cold and laughter, Helen brewed hot cocoa, and we sat by the fireplace, the crackle of the logs breaking the comfortable silence. I want to try something new, Alex, she said suddenly, setting down her mug. I want to start painting again. I think I'd like you to be part of that journey. I'd love that, I replied, my voice firm with conviction. And maybe, just maybe, we can find new dreams to chase together. That night, as we lay wrapped in each other's arms, the barriers of past sorrows seemed to melt away, replaced by the gentle assurance of shared tomorrows. Helen's breaths were soft against my neck, and I realized that this new beginning wasn't just about romance. It was about rediscovery, about two souls intertwining and moving forward into a future they would shape together. The winter months passed, filled with warmth and quiet contentment as Helen and I explored the new dimensions of our life together. Each day seemed to bring us closer, weaving our experiences and hopes into a tapestry rich with possibility. We attended art classes, explored galleries, and Helen's brushes once again danced across canvases, her dormant passion for painting reawakening like spring after a long frost. It was on a brisk March morning, with the promise of spring whispering through the budding trees, that the unexpected swept through our serene world. I was in the kitchen brewing coffee when Helen walked in, her face unusually pale, her hands trembling slightly. Alex, she began, her voice cracking with nerves. I need to tell you something important. I turned to face her, instantly alert. What's wrong, Helen? I asked, moving closer. She took a deep breath, steadying herself. I'm pregnant, she said, the words dropping between us like stones into still water. For a moment, I was speechless, my mind struggling to align this reality with the life we were building. Helen was older, and we hadn't considered the possibility of a pregnancy. Yet, as I watched her face, lined with anxiety and hope, my shock gradually gave way to a profound, unexpected joy. Helen, are you sure? I finally managed to ask, my voice thick with emotion. 
Yes, I had a feeling, and I took a test this morning. It's positive, she replied, her eyes searching mine for a reaction. A laugh escaped me, born of sheer astonishment and delight. I stepped forward, wrapping her in my arms tightly. This is incredible, Helen, I said, my heart swelling with love for her and the new life she was carrying. Absolutely incredible. Helen's tension melted into relief, and she clung to me, her laughter mingling with mine. I was so worried about how you'd take the news, she confessed. How could I be anything but thrilled? It's a miracle, I said, feeling a profound sense of commitment and awe at the turn our lives were taking. We spent the day talking about what this news meant for us. There were practicalities to consider, health care, rearranging a home, preparing for a child at this stage in our lives. But beneath those logistical discussions bubbled a stream of excitement and wonder. We were going to be parents together, an adventure neither of us had anticipated at this point in our lives. That evening, as we sat together, Helen resting her head on my shoulder, I felt the weight of the responsibility and the burst of joy of what lay ahead. We were embarking on a journey that would challenge us in entirely new ways, but I knew that together we could face anything. Our unexpected news had not just reshaped our future, it had deepened our love, binding us together with new threads of hope and purpose. As Helen's pregnancy progressed, the initial shock and joy gradually gave way to a complex web of emotions and challenges. One of the most daunting was how we would break the news to Sarah. Given the nature of our relationship's beginning and its transformation after her and my divorce, I knew this revelation might reopen old wounds. It was late spring, and the air was filled with the scent of blooming flowers when Helen and I decided it was time to tell Sarah. We invited her over for dinner, hoping that a familiar, comfortable setting would ease the delivery of our news. Sarah arrived looking hesitant, a polite smile fixed on her face. The evening started with casual conversation, but the air was thick with unspoken words. After dinner, as we settled into the living room, Helen took a deep breath and turned to Sarah. Sarah, there's something we need to tell you, Helen began, her voice steady but filled with a nervous energy. I'm pregnant. Sarah's reaction was immediate and complex. Her smile faltered, confusion and hurt flashing across her features before she masked them with a neutral expression. I see, she said slowly, her voice cool. Congratulations are in order then. The words were polite, but the tension in the room spiked. I reached for Helen's hand, squeezing it gently, a silent show of support. Sarah, we wanted you to hear it from us directly, I added. This wasn't planned, but we're committed to this new part of our lives. Helen and I, we hope you can see this as something positive. Sarah looked between Helen and me, her emotions clearly warring within her. After a moment she spoke again, her voice laced with a restrained emotion. It's a lot to take in. Mom, you're going to have a baby at your age, and Alex, you're involved. It's just a lot. Helen nodded, reaching out towards her daughter. I know this is unexpected, and maybe it's difficult for you. But I love you, Sarah, and this changes nothing about how much I care for you. The conversation that followed was difficult. Sarah expressed her fears about the complications of our family dynamics and her concerns about the world seeing her mother in a new light. We listened, acknowledging her feelings and reassuring her of our stable and loving environment at home. As the evening drew to a close, Sarah stood to leave, her emotions still mixed but somewhat calmer. I need some time to process this, she admitted. But I hope everything goes well for you both. Watching her drive away, Helen and I felt a mix of relief and sadness. We knew Sarah's acceptance would take time, and the road ahead might be rocky. But together, we believed in our strength to navigate these tensions, hoping that time would bring our family closer again. The months following our conversation with Sarah were a blend of anticipation and anxiety. While Helen's pregnancy progressed healthily, the emotional terrain of our expanding family remained uncertain. However, as the due date approached, the reality of the coming change began to settle in for all of us, infusing our interactions with a new sense of urgency to mend fences. Helen was radiant, embracing her pregnancy with a joy that seemed to fill our home with light. As for me, the impending fatherhood brought a profound sense of responsibility and a desire to ensure that our home was a place of peace and happiness. 
It was on a warm July morning that our daughter, Emma, was born. She arrived in the world with a quiet determination, her first cries as soft and gentle as the dawn. In the hospital, holding Emma for the first time, I felt an overwhelming surge of love, an unspoken promise to protect and cherish this new life we had created. When we introduced Emma to Stara, I noticed a change in her demeanor. The sight of her half-sister, so tiny and perfect, seemed to soften the hard edges of the past month's tensions. Sarah's initial awkwardness gave way to a tender curiosity as she reached out to gently touch Emma's hand. Hi there, little one, Sarah whispered, a smile breaking through. It was the most open and genuine I had seen her since our dinner announcement. Helen watched the interaction, tears brimming in her eyes. Later, as we sat in our living room with Emma sleeping peacefully in her cradle, Helen reached for my hand. Thank you, she said simply, for being here for everything. As the weeks turned into months, our new family began to find its rhythm. Sarah visited more frequently, each time a little more at ease, her conversations with Helen growing longer and filled with laughter. The strain that had once marked their interactions began to fade, replaced by a cautious optimism. One particularly crisp autumn afternoon, as we all sat in the backyard watching the leaves fall in a blaze of orange and red, Sarah brought up a topic we hadn't discussed in depth. I've been thinking, she started hesitantly, about how Emma will need someone to look up to. I, I'd like to be involved to be a good sister. Helen's response was immediate and full of warmth. Oh, Sarah, that would mean the world to us. To me. That day marked a turning point. It wasn't just the formation of a new family, but the rebirth of old bonds, now stronger and more resilient. Emma brought us together in ways we couldn't have anticipated, her presence healing old wounds and paving the way for new beginnings. As I watched my family interact, a tapestry of the old and new woven together by love and forgiveness, I realized that this was what I had always sought. A home filled with love, a family united not just by blood, but by a deep, enduring bond. And in the quiet moments, watching Emma sleep, feeling Helen's hand in mine, and seeing Sarah laugh, I knew that despite the unconventional paths we had taken, we had arrived exactly where we were meant to be. Together, as a family, ready to face whatever the future might hold. 